The Child Psych Podcast brings to you the top parenting and mental health experts in the world, designed to educate and inspire you with current research and concrete strategies that foster resiliency and healing in children and teens. Most importantly, we're here because we need to raise a generation of children who don't need to recover from their childhoods. Welcome, everyone, to the Child Psych Podcast. My name is Tammy Schmoon. I am the co-founder of the Institute of Child Psychology. I'm a registered psychologist and play therapist, and most importantly, a mom of three amazing kids. In today's podcast, we are going to be interviewing Dr. William Stixrud, a neuropsychologist and co-author of the book, The Self-Driven Child, one of my favorite parenting books of all time. We're going to be talking about how to foster true motivation in our kids and how to set our children on the real road to success without coercion or micromanaging. Everyone, if you love today's podcast, please visit icphelps.com or your favorite podcast platform and give this podcast a review. This helps us so much in building this community and we so appreciate your support. Dr. William Stixrud is a clinical neuropsychologist and founder of the Stixrud Group, as well as a faculty member at Children's National Medical Center and an assistant professor of psychiatry. He and his colleague, Ned Johnson, are co-authors of the national best-selling book, The Self-Driven Child, and their new book, What Do You Say? Talking to Kids to Build Motivation, Stress, Tolerance, and a Happy Home. We are so grateful to have you on today's podcast, Bill, and just happy to get started. So why don't you tell us a little bit how this came about, the work you did on the self-driven child? Why don't you give us a little bit of background? I started reading in 1998 about what stress does to the brain, including what it does to the developing brain. And so I lectured a lot about what I was learning about how really the kind of negative effects of kids being stressed all the time and being pressured all the time and being tired all the time. And my buddy, Ned Johnson, and I started lecturing together and a lot about stress, a lot about sleep, and a lot about motivation. And we were struck by how many kids, that, that we, most of the kids we see you know, have an anxiety disorder or are close to it these days. And we're also, I see kids, I'm a neuropsychologist and I test kids for a living. So I see kids, a lot of kids who, who are, aren't very motivated for school. If I'm not doing, I'm not an A student. Why should I bother trying? And Ned is an SAT prep guy. And he, he sees all these kids who are obsessively driven. They'd sacrifice themselves and their health and their family to get into the most elite college. And we thought, yeah, this is really, these are really motivational disorders. And so we, we were really so concerned about all these stress-related mental health problems and these kind of what we consider to be unhealthy motivation. And we've, we discovered that the key to both, that anxiety and low motivation, and it turns out that a low sense of control is the most stressful thing in the universe. It's the most stressful thing you can experience. And it's related to every kind of anxiety disorders, related to depression. And so we focused on, we've got to increase kids' sense of control because that, that's the key to treating anxiety and mood problems. And also, every place we look, Tammy, to try to understand how do kids become self-motivated, that healthy inner drive to develop themselves. Every arrow pointed to autonomy or the sense of control. So as we were writing this self-driven child, we were thinking this is a really important idea, this, this sense of control. And every place we looked while we were writing it confirmed every place you, once you start thinking about this. No, I'm hearing there's a bit of a pendulum here. Like on one side, you've got kids who are in this state of like learned helplessness where they just like completely give up. And on the other hand, you've got kids who are hyper-focused, but it comes at a cost, what I'm hearing is to their mental health, where yeah. they're so focused and there's so much pressure, but they eventually, I think maybe we see this as they enter college or they enter adulthood, that they can't keep that up. Well, that's the thing. We're talking a lot now of wanting kids to develop sustainable ways of pursuing a successful life. And from our point of view, a successful life is one you're happy with. You know, and we see so many people who have all kinds of money, they have great career success, and they're miserable. You know, and for me, a successful life is having a life that you're really happy with. And we, we think we can start earlier in, in helping kids really know how to think about developing a life that they're going to be happy with. 
And when we think about sense of control, Tammy, we think about it in two dimensions. One is that subjective sense of autonomy or agency, you know, where kids have the sense that I'm not helpless, I'm not hopeless, I'm not overwhelmed all the time. And secondly, it's the brain state that supports that sense of control, which is where your prefrontal cortex, the most recently evolved part of your brain that can think clearly and put things in perspective and, and calm yourself down when you start to get stressed, when that prefrontal cortex regulates the rest of the brain, including the amygdala, which senses max the threat. And so what we want, so we have two dimensions, we have two angles here for helping kids develop a sense of control. One is giving them more autonomy. And a second is helping them stay well-rested and not unduly stressed so that their brain actually works in a way that they can experience a sense of control. Yeah. But I think what I'm hearing you say too, when you're talking about money and you're talking about happiness is pulling back. Because I think as a parent, one of the biggest challenges is whether you're aware of it or not, sometimes we like to live vicariously through our kid. We have this idea of what having a kid is going to be like. And maybe things we didn't accomplish or things we have these hopes. And then we put all of this pressure on these kids that we say, this is how life should be. And you have to be this way to make me happy, to make me feel good enough as a parent. So I think one of the first steps I'm hearing kind of interwoven in what you're talking about is parents taking a step back and saying, my child needs to find their path. You know, my child needs to figure out what makes them happy, not necessarily what makes me happy or what I think happiness is going to be for them. That's hard for parents to do. Well, it is. And the older I get, the more humble I become about knowing what's in a kid's best interest. Because so often, something that seems like a disaster a month later, a year later, two years later, saying, oh my God, thank God for that. That led me to something better. And so uh, Ned and I think that what we want to do as parents is help our kids learn to run their own lives so that they can run their own lives successfully before they leave home and go off to college or whatever they're going to do. And to stay, so we take that step backward. How do we do that? Well, we give up the idea that somehow we're supposed to be able to force our kids or make them do certain things. And we start to think about ourselves more as a consultant to our kid. The title of the second chapter in The Self-Driven Child is, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And the idea is you say that, and then you say, now, I'm willing to be your homework consultant. I'm, I'm willing to help you in any way I can. I'm willing to help you figure out how to get this stuff done. Or if I can't figure it out, I'll get you a tutor. But I love you too much to fight with you all the time. And I also, if I act like it's my job to make you do your homework, but I couldn't make you do it, all you have to do is flop to the floor or close your eye. I couldn't make you do it. That if I act like it's my job, that I, it weakens you because it reinforces the idea that somebody other than you is responsible for this. And I love you too much to do that to you. But as a former elementary teacher, I remember, and even when I used to sub substitute teach in older grades, was that kids would have homework or like a book report or a diorama they had to do. And you see the quality and you know the parents are doing it for them. And like, what's the lesson here? Like mom and dad are going to jump in. They're going to do things for them. They're going to rescue them. So we as parents must not believe in them that they can handle the world. Right. And two, it just takes, they don't learn from their mistakes. They don't learn that if they don't hand it in, there are consequences to their actions. And then when they're out in the real world, they're not going to have mom and dad there to bail them out when they don't get the report to their boss by 5 p.m. on a Friday. Or the college professor needs, you know, you to turn in an assignment and mom and dad aren't living with you in the dorm rooms on campus to hold you accountable. Well put. <laughs> you know, I think we think that it's, we want kids to have an accurate model of reality, including an accurate sense of who's responsible for what. And if we take responsibility for something that's really a kid's responsibility, it's just you're saying we weaken them. Because the way that kids become resilient and develop the high stress tolerance, ability to function well in stressful situations, and develop the confidence that they can handle hard situations is by doing it. And if we do everything we can to guide their life and make sure they never have any, hit any potholes, and if they have a problem, we try to solve it for them, we deprive them of that crucial experience of something stressful happens. Because here, here's a really interesting thing. When a kid gets stressed, any of us get stressed, what happens is that our flight or fight response, and ideally the prefrontal cortex dampens that down and we go into coping mode. 
that when trying to cope with a problem, your prefrontal cortex gets very active. And it, once you're coping, it'll dampen down your stress response. If you're in a stressful situation and you're dealing with it, it's not that stressful. It's when you feel, I don't know what to do, or you feel overwhelmed. Again, the way you develop confidence, I can handle hard stuff, is by handling hard stuff. After we wrote The Suffering Child, it really became clear why it's so hard for us to take a step back. But part of it is that as mammals, we're wired to, to protect our young and to soothe them. And when they're infants, we have to do that. We have to protect them and we have to soothe them when they're upset because they can't soothe themselves yet. But as they get older, if we continue to try to do the protecting and the soothing that as you're just saying, it doesn't really help. But it's hard because if the most stressful thing in the universe is a low sense of control, and you start not solving your kids' problems, you start not kind of micromanaging their life, you have to sit on your hands and button your lip if we want kids to be independent, if we want them to be able to, to have high, what we call in our second book, high stress tolerance, to be able to function well in their stressful situations, they have to have the experience of handling things on themselves. And the first thing we ask parents is to, to say to themselves is, whose problem is it? Because it's so hard not to leap into to solving it for, we need to do this or this, or I'm, I'm gonna call our mom. Just the way we're wired, we have this, what's what they call a writing reflex. You know, somebody brings a problem to us, we try to solve it. And we just have to check that as much as we can. But we want them to have experience and they can master hard situations. Parents, like say you've got little ones. So for instance, I told you I have a six-year-old, I have an eight-year-old and I have a 14-year-old. So for you know parents listening who have maybe a preschooler or early elementary age child, say you know three to six, like we're looking yeah. or how do we start putting them in the driver's seat in healthy way? Where do we help them develop autonomy so they're like, oh, I can do this and I can handle these situations. I gave a lecture a couple of years ago, actually before the pandemic about the self-driven child. And part of it is that giving kids choice and help, help putting them in making decisions. And we can start that with little kids by saying, do you want to do it this way or this way? And the idea is, is communicating respect to kids that they have their own mind, they have their own preferences, they may not see everything the way we do. And so as much as we can, we, we say, do you want to do it this way or that way? Or as they get older, they have more choices. But our feeling is that is with adolescents, you want to really encourage, and, and by the time that they're 16 or 17, require them to make the important decisions about their own life, with, with help as needed, with advice from, from more knowledgeable and more experienced people. But the way you become a good decision maker is you practice making decisions. And we can start that very young. The major implications are number one, we offer our help, we offer our advice. We don't try to form it down, force it down kids' throat. And number two is we encourage decision making as much as possible. As they get older, require them to make decisions because you become confident decision makers by having a lot of practice and making decisions. And third is this idea, as much as possible, letting kids solve their own problems with our support as necessary. You really highlighted in your book that it's not just about like throwing them into the deep end and saying like, sink or swim here, buddy, you got to figure this out. It's still making them feel like you're there for them. A close relationship with a parent is about as close as you can get to a silver bullet protecting kids from the harmful of sex with stress. And certainly one of the things that keeps us from being close to our kids is fighting about the same thing over and over again. We're, we're acting like, I don't really care how you think. I don't really care what your idea is. I don't really care if you want to do this or not. You got to do it. And there may be times when we have to do that just for the survival of our family, but we want to minimize the, the extent to which we're engaged in arguments and fighting with our kids, because it's that feeling of can come to us, they can trust us. That's the thing that really has this hugely protective effect. Kids throughout their lifetime, really. We hope you're enjoying this podcast this week with Dr. William Sticksred on the self-driven child building motivation in our children. If you're loving this, we are so excited to announce that Dr. Sticksred and his co-author Ned Johnson are offering a direct course on this topic in our membership platform on The Self-Driven Child. So it is a full three-hour course where you learn about how to build motivation in your child to really set them up on the road for long-term success and resilience. If you become a member, you can take this course. And right now, we are offering our annual membership at 50% off if you go to icphelps.com. 
you will have not only access to this course, but 70 other courses and workshops, which is hundreds and hundreds of hours of instruction and strategies and videos and workbooks. And you can even certify with us. So again, to take Ned's and Dr. Sticksrud's course on this self-driven child, along with any of our other courses, visit icphelps.com to take 50% off your annual membership. One of the, I want to share with people some of like the ways I have started as a parent using some of the tools you suggested because I have kids at different, different age. Yeah, yeah. And you tell me if you would add, like, just please add some tools to this because I know people are going to uh, want maybe some ideas. I know for my young ones, when they're really tiny, like six and under, giving them choices like, do you want like how they want to decorate their room or the clothes they pick out for school or the, you know, when they're really tiny, it's like, do you want the red cup? Do you want the blue cup? Like, are you going to have a bath first or brush your teeth first? Like we're still getting to the, the goal. Like we we're getting to the place we want to go, but the child's given a little bit of autonomy and how they're going to do that. So they don't feel like they're being coerced. And then I think of my eight-year-old and a recent one we were able to use was uh, screen time that we as a family had a meeting and said, you know, we don't agree that, you know, people are having in our house are having too much screen time and we have to do something about it. But we want to get your thoughts on one, how much screen time do you think is good? And two, how do we know you're going to be able to handle that? What do you think you can do to remember we've had enough screen time? And thinking this eight-year-old was going to manipulate me a little bit on this. And honestly, she came up with the appropriate amount of time, one hour on her own, and then was saying, you know, I think I need to set a timer for myself. Like I could do that on, on the iPad or we can do it on the kitchen kitchen, the the stove. I was like, oh my gosh, my eight-year-old was able to figure this out without me interfering and cracking down on her is saying, what do you think about this? Because she knows about the effects of screens. We've talked about it. We've talked about how it interferes with learning and her brain and her memory and it makes her stressed out. So granted, we've talked to her about why we want to impose these, which I think is really important. Kids need to know why we have these rules. Our experience, Tammy, is that when kids are trusted and if they're making a decision, they're required to talk with people who get get advice from people who know more than they want their life to work. I was in uh, Chicago uh, giving a lecture, a bunch of lectures uh, a couple weeks ago. We asked this group of thousand teenagers and high school students, how many on your phone more than you really should be? Every single kid raised their hand. They know and they want their life to work. But if we were, if the message we're getting is no, 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 stop that, get off, get off, get off, get off. It's get really hard to help them manage it. What you did was brilliant and beautiful. And the other thing that I really liked with my teenager that I used from your book, especially this idea of a consultant, is my 14-year-old is very introverted, like very introverted, very quiet. And so extracurriculars are really hard for her and just because they're usually involved like really large groups of kids. And, you know, it used to be where with her we'd say you're doing this activity, right? Like you're going to do gymnastics or you're going to do swimming or you're going to do – and we just kind of told her and then she'd fight and I don't want to do it and – We simply said, you know, everybody in the family, so no one is exempt from this, has to participate in something in the world where you're out of the house, whether you're volunteering or in a sport or, you know, helping the neighbor carry your groceries. I don't care. Like, as long as you're out in the world doing something outside of your bedroom, we're going to give you some control. So we want you to research what that is. So you get to choose. You can look up different dance classes or volunteer things. You can go on Google, look at things in the community you could do. You come to us. We're going to have a meeting about this in a couple of days. And I want to hear your ideas. But the idea is we're still saying there's a, I think we still, it's important you tell me if I'm wrong, that we still have these expectations that are, are still high for our kids, but allowing them some voice in how they follow through with that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, that I love what you did. And I think that we have a well, it was chapter. Well, it was your skill, by the way. I learned from your well, book. So thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I just, it worked for me. I had two very different kids and, and they're both very successful, very happy adults. And, and I just, I was walk this walk. I don't remember exactly how I knew this stuff, but it works. And what I wanted to say was that I feel the best message you can give a teenager is that I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of experience doing that. And also, you know, this idea that kids want li- their lives to work. And I think that when you respectfully say, this is our kind of, this is our, everybody in our family does this, you figure out your own way. 
I think it dramatically reduces the pushback because kids know, kids know that it's not good for me to just be home myself all the time. They know, they know. And I think that also we can tell them that the major manifestation of anxiety is we avoid stuff. And we know that the more we avoid stuff that makes us anxious, the more anxious we get. For kids who are introverted, or kids who are, who are shy or kind of anxious or in groups of people, that it's not like we want, you have to be in a group of people all day, but the more, if they don't have some exposure, letting kids know that I can't support that because I want to find some way for you to get outside the house and do something that works for you. But I can't support you just being home all the time and avoiding because that's not healthy. Very, very powerful. Beautiful. And I know we're running out of time here. The one thing I wanted to really address was this homework thing, because I like that idea of the consultants, which is really hard for parents. So if we were to look at your book on parents, how they can kind of start that role as the consultant, just as kids progress. I know for me in my home, I really liked what you said in your book that says, you know, you say I'm available for you to help with your homework between 630 and 730. If you have homework you need to do, but pretty much like that's it. Like it, it really is for in my home, that's simple. You know, I don't harp on my kids now. I sometimes hear back from the teacher when they don't do things. And my response is, did you talk to my son about that? Did you talk to my daughter? Because it's her homework. And now that doesn't work maybe for a six-year-old, but then the expectations aren't super high for homework. But does that, so what, you know, those are a few things that I learned from you, which actually are quite effective. <laughs> What else would you say, like how parents withdraw that harping on their kids to do homework and, or doing it for them or, you know, what would you say? I think what we can appropriately do is because you couldn't make your kid do your homework. I mean, do his homework. (laughs) Obviously, if they flop to the floor, they close their eyes or they'd start screaming. You can't make them do it. So just make peace with that. So if, if you couldn't make them, it couldn't be your job. It couldn't be your responsibility. So don't think I'm being a responsible parent by not trying to make my kid do his homework because you aren't supposed to be able, because you couldn't do it. It's impossible. If a kid doesn't want to do it, he doesn't do it. So make peace with that. Get really clear about that. Secondly, make sure that the kid has, there's time in his day and there's a place where you can do it and say to him, you know, if you need me, I'll be your homework consultant. You know, I'll sit with you. I'll help you figure out the directions or I'll, if you just want a warm body, I'll, I'll get my, some work I can do. I'll, or I'll read while you do your stuff. If it just makes you, because a lot of kids, but the thing about homework, it makes them anxious. So just having a warm body sometimes can, can help them. See, you, you can offer very, and, and if you say, look, if you really need, something's really hard for you, I'll try to find a tutor that can help you with it. But just emphasizing that I'm willing to help. Again, it's not like it's your life, buddy, or you're on your own. It, it's that, no. that I'm not going to try to force you, that I'll be your consultant. I'm, I'll help you in any way I can, but I love you too much to kind of fight with you about this or to act like, like I said earlier, like it act like somehow I'm supposed to be able to make you do it. And I don't want to weaken you. I remember seeing these two kids, like the first year my, I was a neuropsychologist at Georgetown University. And I saw these two kids. One was 19, a year old boy with ADHD and a second grade girl with ADHD. And the, the second grade girl would come home dutifully after school. And I don't know why she had homework, but she had homework. Um, and she would sit with her mother and do the homework and then before she went out and play. And she wouldn't go out and play until she did her homework. The 19-year-old boy had just flunked all his classes the first semester, had barely, barely gotten through high school, flunked all his classes the first year of college, first semester, was in the second semester. And the parents said to me, Oh gosh, he's really turned around. No, he's he's going to the library every night. He's going to see his professors. And the kid told me, I haven't been to class in three weeks. And so he's going to flunk all his class. And what I realized, he's 19, she's seven. It's that she had the mo- an accurate model of whose responsibility to work is her homework. This kid had spent his whole life resisting other people's attempts to get him to work. And that's a terrible way, especially for teenagers to use their energy as resisting adults' attempts to get them to do what's probably in their own best interest. Um, so I, I just think that being really clear about who's responsible for what is enormously helpful. And it can just, so many parents have told me that, that when they said to their kid, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And they, they, they move in this consultant role. They help in any way they can. They get an older kid to come in and help with homework if they just need kind of a homework monitor. That they say the temperature in our house is, is reduced by 20 degrees. You know, it's just, it's so much calmer and it's respectful to kids. 
Yeah, I just think a lot of parents are governed by a lot of fear around this. And I always like to tell parents that there isn't a lot of evidence or research to support how helpful homework is, for one thing. We've done some work on that, some research of our own. It's not till they're in their their later teen years that we even see evidence that it's super helpful. And even then, it has to be governed by their passions and should be where they have autonomy over the tasks. It shouldn't be repetitive tasks. They should be thinking for themselves and integrating their interests. And so I always tell parents, I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't stress so much about that. I think for me, the biggest thing is that that we look at for younger kids is that they know how to read is the biggest one and they know how to communicate verbally. And those are the things I would, you know, want to make sure we work with kids on. But other than that, I, I just tell parents just relax about the homework thing. We're very obsessed with that in Western culture and there's not a lot to substantiate it. So I don't want them to undermine their teacher, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm not, I know not to stress about it too much yeah. because I know the research doesn't support a ton of homework for kids anyway. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that, that's the thing that kind of, in 1986, that kind of drove me a little crazy. I researched the effects of homework on learning for the first time in 1986 and realized that found out that at least in elementary school, no effect at all on learning. And I'd see so many families would say to me, it's like World War III after the, after dinner, trying to get my, my kid do his homework. And I'd work with underachievers. I've always, and if I was asked them, if you don't turn in an assignment, who's most upset? And who would you guess, Tammy? The parent. The well, my mom. The teacher. The, Teacher almost always my it's almost always my mom. Then I'd use the family therapy technique. Said, well, who's next <clears throat> most upset? My dad. Who's next most? My teacher. Then my tutor. Then my, and the kid was never on the list. And I realized we got to change the energy here so that the kid understands that really this is my life and I'm going to get out of what I put into it. I think the most powerful thing I took from your book was the consultant role and understanding like kids want their lives to work out. I have two kids, one of whom probably could have raised, her, <laughs> most part, raised herself. She certainly could have educated herself. And she got a, she got a PhD in uh, economics, working with a Nobel Prize winner at the University of Chicago. And she was always a good student. And she had, she grew up with her father said, I don't care about your grades. And grades have very little connection. I want you to work hard to develop yourself so you have something useful for other people. My son had an ADHD and, and learning disabilities, and he was on a very different kind of track, but he was bright enough and um, he had no academic pressure at all. And just be, he wanted to develop himself. And he, he's, he became a very successful psychologist in the business world. He's, he's so good interpersonally uh, um, that he was able to use it in psychology. But he got a PhD. Both my kids got PhDs without any academic pressure. And I, so I just know it can be done. My parents didn't go to college. It's not like that I needed them to, to model for me or tell me why you need to do this. I figured out my own. And kids can if we trust them. Beautiful. Okay. So our rapid fire questions. And the first being, what is the worst advice you've ever heard about parenting? The idea that everything the kid does has to have a consequence so that they learn not to do it again. And I think that we know that very frequently the kids who get the most consequences learn the least from them. We want to remember that discipline really means helping kids learn from their experience. And it doesn't mean that everything has a bad consequence. Focusing on a relationship and making sure we have a close relationship, that's the best way that we can ultimately discipline our kids. Okay. So then is that the best advice you would say at the same well, time? Like how you reframe that? That would be no, the next question. No, the best advice <laughs> is the advice that we give, which is remember, it's your kid's life. Remember, it's your kid's life. This is his life. And somebody told me, Tammy, years ago, I don't remember who it was, that the coolest thing about raising an adolescent is that every day when he or she comes home from school, you get to see who they're deciding to be. And I love that. I love the perspective that I don't know who they're going to want to be when they grow up. They don't know either. My job is not to try to force them a certain way. My job is to try to help them figure out who they want to be and how to get there. I am just so grateful that you took the time to sit with me today, Bill. You are always such a guiding light in my life. Your book has been so inspiring when it comes to raising my three kids. And I'm just glad our audience could hear more about your work. Everyone, if this really resonated with you, please know that Dr. Sticksrud and Ned Johnson have a course with us at the Institute of Child Psychology called The Self-Driven Child, which is based, basically, it's a summation of their book with all 
of the strategies and tips to really foster long-term motivation in your children. And if you become a member with us, you can take this course. So if you visit icphelps.com, you can sign up for our membership and learn more from Dr. Sticksred and Ned Johnson. And what other than, uh, you know, your website, which by the way is www.theselfdrivenchild.com, other than yeah. maybe your book. Our other book came out a year ago. It's called, What Do You Say? What Do You Say? Yeah. How to Talk with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. And I think you we, we love that new book too. There's a lot of good stuff about communicating with kids. Those two books, certainly, we have, there's a lot of stuff that we, a lot of our lectures. Well, and we have a course coming out from you too. We haven't released it That's yet, right. but by the That's time right. this podcast comes out, it will be released. So we're super excited about that, where you can learn about their work. But what's your, another resource that you would recommend outside of your work to parents? You know, I really like the work of Tina Payne Bryson, Dan Siegel. I think they have arguably the most popular parenting book the whole of the last 20 years, The Whole Brain Child. I like their work. There's a really good parent education program located here in Maryland called the Parent Encouragement Program. They're doing a lot of virtual work now, and so people could access that. They have very similar philosophy. Somebody from actually this program that I, I picked up that idea of asking, reminding yourself, whose problem is it? They have a lot of good thinking. And also, Jane Nelson's classic book, positive discipline, mm -hmm. where Jane Nelson's make the point that we often think that we can't, you know, that we want kids to pay for it. We, we use punishment so that they pay for what they did, as opposed to having them learn from what they do. And that, yeah. that, I think I, I love her. Well, discipline really means to teach. And I know Dan Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson talk about that in their book, No Drama Discipline. But yeah. that really is our role, isn't to in, inflict pain or it, it's really to say, you know, to act as a guidance system for our kids. Yeah, It's not to know, solve their problems. It's not to be a problem to our children. It's really about, yeah, I want to teach you the skills so you can feel competent in your life, that you yeah. can be on your own and have some autonomy, but I'm still here for you and I'm still... I'm still on your side, no matter what. Thank right. you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. But uh, it was a pleasure as always. And we're really okay. excited to release your course. We're just formatting yeah. it right now. Okay. Wonderful to see you, Tammy. We have so much more to share with you at ICP. And whether you're looking for parenting support or you're a professional looking for strategies to help children who are struggling with their mental health, we have the answers you're looking for. At ICP, we offer a unique membership program that gives you access to over 60 accredited online courses and past conference workshops offered by the top experts on the planet and also provides a community platform where you can connect with like-minded professionals and parents sharing ideas, resources, as well as advice from the ICP team of professionals. You can access our courses and workshops through your desktop or through our app offered exclusively to our members please go to icphelps.com to start your journey with us today.